to wrap up the first part, the intro, to um, our next section in the uh, family affair. We've been talking about family affair for, for quite some time, the dynamic of uh, family. We've covered husbands and wives. We have just gotten into parents and children. Um, last week I gave you some examples. I, I, I really didn't finish my examples. I want to do that this week. Um, did we cover Eli last week? For Samuel 2? Yes. We did. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Okay, so what I am wanting you to see in, in listing these examples is that there were some incredibly mighty men and women of God who had stinkers for children, okay? Who, who uh, had children that grew up to be stinkers, okay? Uh, we talked about Adam and Eve. The very first parental child in, in existence and and at the same time the first sibling in existence and they blew it okay Cain killed Abel you want to talk about sibling, sibling rivalry okay I'm pretty sure that uh, one or another of my siblings has tried to do the same with me at least it felt that way you know um, if I have brain damage you can you can thank my brother Todd because he liked to take me in a headlock and run me into the wall, okay? It, it, it made me very hard-headed. Um, but the first one, the first dynamic is messed up already. We, we talked about Isaac and Rebekah and Esau giving up his birthright and Jacob stealing Esau's birthright. We, we looked at the whole dynamic, the insanity that was uh, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and... Uh, they're, they're handmaidens and, and this, this understanding, and I, I don't get this. Um, if you ask my children, which one of them is mom's favorite? They are all going to say they are. Okay? If you ask my children, which one of them is my favorite, what will they say? None of them? None of them. <laughs> okay. My job is to balance out the inflated head that Christy gives my children. Okay. I, I got to keep them with the understanding that, you know, your mom sees you as Superman. I see you as a kid in, in blue leotards running around with a cape. Okay. So, um, but we, we, we see that Jacob had a definite favorite, don't we? Uh, scripture tells us that he preferred Joseph to all of his siblings. Okay? Um, that, that didn't go well for a while, but God used it. Okay? Uh, we talked about Eli and, and his sons. And because Eli did not correct his son's behavior, his family was cursed. Okay? We're talking the descendants of Eli were cursed because Eli did not reign his sons and teach them to do what they should do and, and not do what they should not do. Um, we come to Samuel. Uh, if you have your Bible, open to 1 Samuel chapter 8. <coughs> By what we see in scripture, was Samuel a godly man? Yeah. Uh, 
he, he's the only man in all of Scripture that we know. Uh, scripture says that not a not a one of his words fell to the ground. Okay. I, I, I think God put such an anointing on him that when he opened his mouth, God spoke. Okay. Um, in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, it says, When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, uh, I don't say this with certainty, but I have found no other judge that, that was appointed a father, dad, that did what his dad did. I see examples of others that, that were uh, biological descendants of a judge that were accounted judges, but right here, I mean, we look through the book of Judges. Who appointed the judges? Well, God did, okay? And we see here, Samuel is, is getting old. He made his sons judges over Israel, and the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. Peachy. Verse 3. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Now, now just so you see how the story comes out, I want to read just a couple verses more. Uh, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Okay, so I, we'll pause there. We'll just stop right there. I would encourage you to read that story because Samuel's hurt. He's offended. I mean... Basically, they are calling into question his office, and they're saying, we want no more of this, give us a king, make us like the rest of the world. And, and when Samuel goes to God, God says, hey, don't worry about it. It's not you that they rejected, it's me. Okay? And then we move into the era of kings. Okay? But I want to I wanna stay right here in the first few verses for just a little bit. Um, whose fault is it that, that his children did not walk in his ways? Anyone? I heard you speak, but I couldn't hear your word. It's the sons, not the fathers. Hmm. How do you suppose they got to the point where they were so unlike their father? Yeah. Ultimately, here's, here's the thing. As creatures, as creations with free will, we can choose to do or not do. Okay. Um, you know, the, the passage in Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I, I want you to understand. A lot of people stand on this as a promise, saying, well, we trained up our, our children as Christians, and then they got older, and they forsook the church, and they're not in fellowship, and they fall into the world, and, um, you know, but the, I'm standing on the scripture. Absolutely, you can stand on the scripture. But I want you to understand that this was an observation that Solomon was making. When these situations occur, this is usually what comes out of it. And by the way, the way that passage actually should is best rendered is uh, train up a child in the, according to his bent. <coughs> according to his nature. Okay? Um, not to the way he should go, because there's only one way he should go. Okay, So we look at this. Um, we see the qualifications for elders and deacons, uh, that they have their households in order. And, and yet we see Samuel, who is considered one of the greatest prophets. Uh, if we apply that rule from Titus to him and his grown sons, he wouldn't have even made it as a deacon or an elder in our church. And I mean our church like the church today, not Jesus Community Church, okay? Um, because he didn't have his household in order, did he? Or did he? It says that his children were uh, old enough to be judges. So whose household were they in? Their own. Their own. 
Yeah, uh, I think when, when Paul is writing that, I think he's talking about the people that make up a particular household, not the, all of the branches uh, upward or downward or sideways. Okay, I think he's talking about who is in your home now. Okay, um, but we don't know how Samuel fathered. We don't know how he he uh, directed, how he governed, how he disciplined. The scripture doesn't tell us this. Okay, just like Eli, one generation before, um, we see that there was a man who was serving God, and he had children that didn't serve God. Okay. I don't think we can ascribe blame to a parent of a grown child that chooses to walk away from the word. Okay, here you see here's here's the trick. Here's the, the paradox of this. There are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There are children and there are not of the kingdom of God. Because you can't come in on anybody's shirt tails. Okay. My salvation is not a guarantee for any of my children that they're going to heaven. Okay, Just like I had to make a personal choice to follow God. And my mom's salvation couldn't get me in the door. The only person I can get in the door with is Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, So as parents, uh, I remember... Um, Mackenzie was really struggling. Oh, it's so good you're here, Mackenzie. Um, she was really struggling with um, being saved. She was really struggling. I think she was under a lot of conviction. Uh, and she and Christy were, were driving in the, the, I don't even know what car, they were driving in something. And they were talking about um, how we ran our household and our expectations for our children that you will go to church, you will be involved at church. And uh, Mackenzie said, well, what if I don't believe that? And Christy said, too bad, because that's the way we run our house. You, you, you can choose to reject God, but guess what? You're still coming to church. You're still going to Sunday school. You're still going to Bible study, okay? Now, when Mackenzie moved out of our house, she became Josh's problem. <laughs> but you'll notice that they're both here. <laughs> okay? So, I want to encourage you. Let's, let's go uh, one more that uh, I want to discuss here. Um, David. What does the Bible say about David. He was a man after God's own heart. What does that mean? I don't know either. <laughs> uh, I think that David had an incredibly rare understanding of who God was. It was intimate and it was personal. Okay? And it was ongoing. Okay? And yet, David had some messed up kids. Okay. Um, I, I, I told you last week I can't really understand with the way that, that some things uh, happened in the in uh, ancient times. Um, you know, David had multiple wives. I don't understand that because God told them through Moses that when they came in the land and the time came that they wanted a king, that he should not have multiple wives. And yet, we see David is a man after God's own heart, and he has multiple wives. I, I don't know how that works. Okay? I, I do know we can understand that in some measure um, because of Pinesdale, and, and even not, not Pinesdale, but we have so many families that are, are, are I don't even know how to describe it. You, you have these two that had these two, and then these two went this way, and they had two, and, and, and then... I got to watch a girl when I was subbing at Corvallis that tried to diagram a family tree of all of her um, siblings, half, step, and otherwise. And wow, that was a gnarly and twisted tree. Okay. Um, so 
when I'm saying that, so you'll understand, I don't really see how it works with David having multiple wives. Christy is all I can handle. Christy is more than I can handle. Um, and yet we know that uh, David had a son named Amnon, and Amnon fell in love with Tamar, who was Absalom's sister. Absalom is a, a son of David through another woman. And Amnon fell in love with her, and, and actually, I, I don't think he fell in love. Let me correct that. I think he fell in lust. Okay. And so he was talking with his friend, and his friend said, well, here, here's a good plan. Pretend you're sick and, and ask your dad to send Tamar to, I don't get that stuff at all. Dad, I'm sick. Send me my half-sister to fix it. You know, my family, you're sick, shut up. <laughs> Just because you're sick doesn't mean that, you know, I want to hear you whine about it. Go to bed. If you get up and you still don't feel well, go back to bed. Okay? Um, David acquiesces. He sends Tamar and, and Amnon, in essence, he rapes her. Okay? Now, again... This, this is something I don't understand because they were in the city of David and the law very clearly states that uh, if, if a woman is raped in a city and she does not call out, then she and he have committed adultery. It's not rape. But if they do it in the country where people couldn't hear her, then she's to be given the benefit of the doubt. <coughs> okay? So evidently nobody heard her or she didn't scream. Okay. But then, as soon as, as the, the deed was done, Amnon, who thought he had this great love for her, that completely flip-flopped, and he had incredible disdain for her. I've known men like this. The action is the pursuit, and once they've got what they're looking for, they're not interested anymore. Okay. Um, so he puts her out. <coughs> Absalom hears about what's going on and, and he sets into plan a motion. Some time goes by and the harvest is coming in and he invites all of his siblings, half step or otherwise, to come and, and celebrate with him and, and then uh, he kills Ammon. Okay? And we see how this, this, this generational curse actually comes into place because see David did the same thing with Bathsheba. He uh, well, he didn't rape her. Scripture doesn't say he raped her. It says he took her, but she was. there were servants around. She didn't call out for help. I think she was a willing participant. Okay? And God, through Nathan, spoke to David and said, this is what God's going to do. The, the child that she now has, the child's going to die. And what was the second part of that prophecy? One of David's sons was going to do in the open to David what David did in secret to Uriah. Okay? And guess which son it was? Absalom. It was Absalom. Okay? So Absalom is exiled. Joab goes, gets him. There's this whole political fiasco, blah, 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 a lot like today. And then David brings Absalom back. And then Absalom starts gathering followers to himself. He attempts to out David, and, and, and you know the story, okay? If not, you should know the story. Um, First Kings, um, what is it? It might be, actually, let me look real quick. I want to make sure I've got the right scripture here. First Kings chapter 1. Verse 1. Oh, good grief. Okay, no, that's not it. It's, it's back in uh, Samuel. Um, so we see the fiasco that comes. David takes uh, his people and they escape Jerusalem. Absalom comes in and he sleeps with David's concubines in public. Okay? Fulfilling God's prophecy. Now, um, we know the rebellion happened. We know that Absalom got caught up 
in a tree. That's nothing I ever have to worry about. <laughs> um, Joab killed him. David mourned for him, and Joab basically slapped him down. He said, look, these men followed you. They stood by you. And here you sit mourning for your son, who is the reason they had to stand by you. And so David cleaned himself up, and he congratulated the men as they came in. But see, that's not the end of David's story, is it? Okay, that's just one aspect of it. Because if you go to 1 Kings chapter 1, go ahead and flip there. Satch, could you get water, please? Uh, okay, we're just going to start in verse 1. Now, King David was old. There's a lot of people get old in the Bible. <laughs> and advanced in years. You notice he separates those two things? There's old and there's advanced in years. Okay? Because old is not necessarily a number of years. It's, it's how those years affect you. Because I've known people that were old in their 50s. And I know people that were advanced in years that I would not consider old. Okay? Um, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman be brought for my lord, the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord, the king, may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, the Shunammite, uh, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Okay? Yes, that's uh, a, a very civilized way of saying they did not have sex. <clears throat> okay? Now, as we go on in the story, and you can read down through the passage here, David has another son by the name of Adonijah. And Adonijah sees David's getting on in years, and he wants the throne. So he stages a, a, a coup. Not, not, no, it's not a coup, because it wasn't necessarily the military, but it was a, a popular um, gathering. And he has uh, a prophet and a priest crown him king. Okay. David's in bed. He doesn't know what's going on. And so Bathsheba and Nathan come to, to uh, David. And they tell him what's going on. And Bathsheba's saying, hey, look, you said it was my son that was going to be king. You know, Lemuel. I don't know how tall he was. Okay. And so David said, here's what we do. He says, you, you take uh, one of my horses. You put uh, Solomon on it. Um, you, you parade him through the streets and declare him to be king. And... and well, everybody is celebrating with Adonijah, and all of a sudden there's this loud roar, and, and, and uh, the, the king, the king, and they're like, wait a minute. I thought you were the king. No. Okay. So Solomon becomes king. He is an anointed king uh, to follow David, and he, in his kingship, he has mercy for his brother Adonijah. And then Adonijah just proves to us that he was super thick in the head. Okay? Because Adonijah goes to Bathsheba and he asks her for a favor. Anybody remember what he asked her? He said, ask on my behalf. Ask the king, who is at this point is Solomon. Ask on my behalf that I be given Abishag the Shunammite as a consort. Bathsheba's like, okay. And she goes in to Solomon and she says, I, I have a favor to ask you. And he says, tell me, it's yours. Well, I want you to give Abishag to your brother Adonijah. Now, uh, Solomon sees beyond the immediate thing right in front of him and he understands that Adonijah has not given up on the throne because he wants his father's last consort to be his wife, and he thinks that's going to put him in a position to uh, have a case against Solomon being king. And so Solomon, his answer to Bathsheba is, 
a curse be on me if Adonijah is not dead by this evening. And he sends out his men and they go. And, you know, I mean, you kind of wonder what Adonijah was thinking. Because they weren't bringing a woman, they were bringing a sword. Okay? Now, these are all descendants. These are all children of David. A man after God's own heart. Okay? Um, we, we can even go a step further because Solomon had a son. Okay? And, and Solomon didn't turn out to be all that great himself. Okay? But, but he had a son, uh, Rehoboam. And it didn't take Rehoboam but just a couple weeks to blow his kingship in. Okay? Um, so we can look through scripture and, and we can see example after example after example of godly parents who have children that do ungodly things. Okay? Now, it, it is my belief that there, there's a twofold thing that we look in this. One, if we look at train up a child in the way he should go as a directive, and we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more later, what are the parents' responsibilities to their children? Um, you know, maybe some of them weren't all that great parents. I don't know. Scripture doesn't make it clear. But what it does make clear, that some of them had ungodly children. Okay? Now, I want to encourage parents who are looking at their children who are ungodly today, <clears throat> there is hope. There is hope. You pray for them and you do not stop praying. Okay? Keep praying. Let your words be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Okay? Speak to them the truth in love. Okay? Let God do the work. Okay? As so many parents I see bash their kids, even grown kids, bash them, trying to save them. <clears throat> That's like uh, being on a boat and you see a person drowning and you throw them the anchor. Doesn't really help. Pray for them. Pray for them. Speak the truth in love. Don't back off of your position at all. But you know, sometimes, uh, actually, a lot of times, it's better that we just shut up. Okay? So, pray for your kids. Now, we're going to talk next week about parents' responsibilities to their children. And the following week, we're going to talk about children's responsibilities to their parents, okay, because it's a two-way street, all right? Um, memory verse for today. Don't put it up. Bum, ba, da, da. Coming. Romans 3, 10. As it is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. Oh. They each got half. <laughs> All right. So we have Psalm 119.11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Romans 3.24. 23. Not, not 24. Nope. 3.10 is next. 3.23. We're on the Romans road. This is... Yes. This, this is the Roman road. This, these few verses make it very clear our condition and his salvation. Okay, so Romans 3.23, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not one. Okay, uh, we'll continue building on these. Um, you know, if you're having trouble remembering these, write it down. <coughs> Every day, sit down, write it down ten times. I guarantee you, by the end of the week, you'll have that thing locked in your brain. Okay? Repetition. Okay.